In the 19th century, there was uh, a vigorous argument that actually continued well into the 1930s as to what were the relationships among human races. And I think the exhibit in the, at the World's Fair started from the assumption that, that they did all belong to one species. And the, uh, the m measurements that were taken, again, head shape, skull shape, skin color, eye color, were to try to establish what the defining features were of each group. Boaz was someone who was fa fairly early on believed that it was important to study the group, not the individual, which is wonderful. He was a statistician, so he was very interested in how, if you took a measurement on a particular feature in a population, how was that distributed? So height. Height is distributed uh, with the, the famous bell curve. It's called a normal distribution. And so he was very interested in, in distributions of characters and where the distributions weren't normal and where they were different. I think the, the questions that physical anthropologists ask today focus principally on how did humans be, become the way they are? What happened in human evolution and why? And that's a very interesting and complicated question. And to answer it, you need to have a number of very different approaches. So you need to know something about the fossil record, the archeological record, uh, the genetic record. You need to be able to interpret the shapes of bones and look at a character like this. Could you make any sense of the way it moved or what it was eating? It's an obvious example if, if you, you're in this business, but not so obvious if you aren't, is skin color. It's now recognized that having a pigmented skin in the tropics is an adaptation to pr protect the inner layers of the skin where vitamin D is being synthesized. And if you get too much UV radiation hitting that, it messes up vitamin D synthesis. So the pigmentation in skin is a kind of natural sunblock. The further north you live, the more trouble you run into in getting enough sunlight into the lower layer, inner layers of your skin in order to synthesize the vitamin D. So it's advantageous to lose your natural sunblock. And that's why as you go north and south of the equator, you see populations that are less and less pigmented. So skin color is an adaptation. It tells you nothing about the relationships of individuals. It just tells you that individuals uh, now live or their ancestors lived in the tropics. The ability to sequence lots of DNA in lots of individuals has been completely transformative for not just the field of human evolutionary studies, but evolution biology in general. In the case of human evolution, we now know that our closest living relative is the chimpanzee. And a more distant relative is the gorilla. It's also been transformative in the way that we think about humans. It turns out that the amount of genetic variation in, in the human species is actually quite small compared to what is the case in most other species that have been studied. It's also changed the way we think about human variation. If you think of the human species and ask what's the total amount of genetic variation you see within the species, and then ask how much of that variation shows up in local populations, such as Ethiopians or Norwegians, what surprised everybody, I think, was that the, something like 85% of the total variation in the human species resides in these more local populations. It's astonishing. And it, it, it's a function, among other things, but, but principally, of the fact that we're a young species and we haven't had that much time to differentiate on a, on a geographical level.